Well, I'd first like to start by saying thank you very much to Linda. One of the reasons I'm delighted to come is uh, Linda keeps sending me these amazing uh, students, uh, really some of the best students I've ever had um, have come from here, and it's really nice for me uh, to be able to come back. Um, a couple of kind of side points. I mean, the lecture I'm giving is going to be on denim, but many of you will know that I'm also working on other topics. So, for example, the book came out recently on Facebook, and I'm happy when I'm around here to chat about other things. If you're bored about denim and you want to chat about something else, um, that's okay. The other thing I was going to say, because I'm not sure I'd get another opportunity, is um, those of you who are particularly interested in material culture will know that I run a blog together with New York University around material culture and anthropology. And one of the points about this blog was it was intended really to help people um, disseminate research results, to, to let people know about the research you're doing. And I can already see from the conference order so many of you doing sort of really interesting sounding work in material culture. Um, so if you want people to hear about it, if you can send two or three, four paragraphs and a couple of like photos about your work and send it to me, I'd be very happy to post it on the blog and let, you know, if I get 20, 30 things from Romania, that's great, okay? So I'd be very happy to put up uh, research material um, into the blog. Now, I'm here to introduce a uh, couple of days centered around material culture, which is great. Um, and I don't want to spend too long, though, um, talking about material culture in general terms. Um, I think where I work, where there's social anthropology and material culture, social anthropologists tend to think, well, material culture is a kind of bit of social anthropology that's interested in things. Um, so we're kind of a subset of them. We tend to have slightly grander ideas as to what's going on here. Um, we tend to think of material culture as, in a sense, bringing us back to a concept of culture in that the, there is a historically given world in which we are born, socialised, become who we are. Um, and that in a sense, the, the, the social side of it, the social anthropology is kind of a, a subset of that. Objectification, as I've described theoretically, comes, as it were, first. Um, so I see material culture as kind of coming out through that kind of dialectical theory, which I'll not bore you with now, except for maybe one other um, aspect of, of that concept of the dialectical, because material culture is not just, I think, bringing us back to that sort of fundamentals around um, what we think about culture and, and practice, um, but it also exemplifies what I would call um, the extremism which I kind of aspire to. Now, what I mean by that, and I've written about elsewhere, is that it seems to me that the whole ideal around anthropology was that compared to everybody else out there, whatever else they're doing, we aim, aim to be the most grounded. We are out there for whatever it is, a year, 18 months, doing our ethnography in the kind of nitty gritty. And the material world, in a sense, almost stands for that. It stands for that kind of engagement with that world. And at the same time, we recognize that if we only do that, we tend to become boring and parochial unless you happen to be interested in the particular people we're working with. Um, and we want actually to use that to try and say things um, at a very general level about humanity um, and to reach the same levels as philosophers and others. But in, in general terms, I would say there's a kind of good and bad extremism. And the, the one I'm not so keen on is where somebody gives a paper and there's this incredibly esoteric kind of philosophical theory here, and there's this very you know, bit of microethnography there, and they got sort of plonked together. I think that one of the things we aspire to is to show all the links, to bring these um, together and show that actually it is reasonable to say that the very bottom talks to the very top and the very top needs to be grounded in the very bottom. Now, I don't want to say anything more about the sort of justification or ideas behind this because the intention today is really to do it by example. Um, to give a study, but you will see that in the presentation of this study today, I am going to try and follow those ideas. I'm going to start very much in the world, as it were, of the genes, um, and then try and start taking it up through analytical and other levels, 
And let's see. I mean, can we take these genes and somehow use them to challenge the foundations of anthropology or have a critical engagement with the whole of Western Enlightenment or whatever? If we can, it's an interesting thing to try and do, all right? Um, but, if, but try and just be sort of pretentious and make those claims will not do. Um, in order to, to do such a thing, we need to show step by step how actually we reach the point at which the material seems to give us authority to speak in those more general terms. The example that I'm going to use today comes from this, um, from denim, from blue jeans. And um, I sort of feel sometimes I choose topics, sometimes kind of topics choose me. And one of the ways topics choose me is when they um, involve what I would call um, the blindingly obvious. And if you think of the phrase, the blindingly obvious, it's something that is so unbelievably obvious, it's so in front of our noses, that somehow we don't seem to see it. And blue jeans strike me as an example of that. Because if you look at the literature on, for example, clothing studies, you find in fashion, there's a journal called Fashion Theory, and it's been going for many years. Um, but there is not a single paper in that journal about blue jeans. Um, and this is supposed to be studies of clothing. And yet, it sort of struck me that, you know, an awful lot of people wear blue jeans. Um, and thinking about that, I thought, well, how many people actually wear blue jeans? And so, um, people inviting me to give papers in different parts of the world, in Rio de Janeiro, in Korea, whatever. Um, I, as I accepted the invitations, I'd go to the place, and I'd stand on a street corner in the middle of the town, right? And I'd stand there, and I'd have a hundred people walk past me, and I'd check out their asses, okay? Now, the amazing thing is that the police didn't arrest me. No, the amazing thing is that actually, if you count people, okay, as they walk past and check out their asses, you find that in case after case, something like 50% of the people are actually wearing blue jeans. So it's like half the people out there, out of all the things they could wear, are wearing blue jeans. Now, some people have research hypotheses. Um, I'm kind of not really one of those. I had one hypothesis. My hypothesis was I didn't know why these people were wearing these blue jeans. And that hypothesis was right, okay? I didn't know. Um, so the aim was to find out, and I couldn't find anybody else who seemed to claim that they knew either. Um, and it seems to me, it's a big thing. It is blindingly obvious, so let's try and find out. I'm rubbish with PowerPoints, but I have a sort of one here. Um, so, yeah. So, um, in, in most countries of the world, I saw. Actually, when I was walking here this morning, um, from the hotel to this place, I did the usual thing. I checked people out, and it was... It was over 60% here wearing blue jeans this morning out here, right? So you lot, you know, this is obviously the right paper for the right place, okay? Um, it is, it is, that is actually unusually high, so um, you can tell me later on why that might be. But in looking at the figures, I mean, it's all over the world. Brazilians tend to have about average of 13 pairs, which impresses me. And I even checked it out on Second Life. You know, I counted people in Second Life to see how many of them were wearing blue jeans, and I got my 50%. So it's like everywhere, even the virtual world. Um, now, I recognise that in blue, if it's 50% of what people wear, it's going to have a fair amount of variety and diversity associated with it. And there are spectacularly expensive uh, blue jeans with companies with strange names like Citizens for Humanity and Seven for All Mankind. Where it comes from, and you can buy them for a thousand dollars or whatever, etc. Um, I'm not talking about those. I doubt I saw any of them walking on the street this morning, right? Um, it's those genes um, that I really want to concentrate on. Now, if you're going to try and understand why people wear these things, then it is reasonable to start with some kind of historical background. Because something we can talk to is why are blue genes blue? Um, and blue jeans are blue um, because there is an amazing history around indigo as a colour. Um, the, the, it starts really because of actually a property of indigo, of the, the plant um, and the dye that comes from it, um, that when, you're, it, when um, people in ancient worlds were dyeing cloth, normally you need something called a mordant, something that fixes the dye to the cloth. 
but with indigo you don't. Um, so it's, it's a very special kind of dye, and there were probably times in the ancient world, um, whether it was the ancient Romans, or maybe Dacians, or would it be all Chinese, that matter, um, the proportion wearing indigo might have been as high then as it is um, today. Um, but I wouldn't go directly from that, because there'd be all sorts of, you know, the Renaissance paintings say it's not particularly indigo. There'd be lots of periods in history where indigo has not had any kind of special work. But, but you can see its importance, and that importance does remain. It's, it's very powerful. I mean, one of the things a lot of people don't appreciate, um, we often read about Haiti, for example, the Caribbean, because of various sort of tragedies that have happened there. And the assumption tends to be with colonialism that colonialism in these kind of areas was about sugar. Actually, for countries like Haiti, it wasn't sugar. It was actually um, for indigo plantations. Um, and the reason you had all these indigo plantations was you needed a hell of a lot of indigo. Um, because uh, Napoleon's army, for example, required 150 tons of indigo to dye 600,000 600, uniforms a year. And that comes from a very nice uh, paper by McTowson called uh, Redeeming Indigo. Um, so we, we know a bit about the background to indigo, and we know a bit about the, the, the other parts of the, the story, in the sense that, yes, it's the blue of indigo. Um, the material um, is familiar to you all. It's the, the, the twist of um, where the, the, you have the warp and the weft with one indigo and the other white, so that as it fades, the, the white comes through, is a characteristic. It's fairly hard wearing, it's cotton. Um, although some have kind of lycra and elastine uh, added into it these days. Essentially, um, we're talking about um, cotton fabric. Um, but to understand why, why and when it becomes um, jeans specifically, um, you have to go back to the 1870s and a really interesting uh, figure of uh, Levi Strauss. And um, this was a very creative time in uh, Levi Strauss's uh, work. It was um, just after he developed the uh, theory of structuralism, um, he then came up with another really interesting idea. And that was that he, um, he realized that, you know, for workers at the time, wearing these kind of clothes um, that were possibly going to tear at certain points, um, that if you took metal rivets um, and put them at the places where things were likely to break, um, you, the clothes would last longer. It was the, put, he didn't invent rivets, but he put together the rivets um, and the clothing. And that produces um, jeans, and it produces the jeans that we know. I mean, Levi's today are not that different from the Levi's um, that were developed um, well over a century ago. Um, there is a decent history of what happens to Levi's. This one by James Sullivan. Um, there's iconic periods in which it, it gets new kinds of significance, because it starts off, yes, around kind of workers and um, in mines and, and in the fields, etc. And then um, you get this change around about the 1950s where it, it goes into a different generation, it gets associated with rebellious youth, um, and you get figures like James D. Marlon Brando, um, and um, then up on the back of that, it becomes associated with a certain kind of uh, liberatory, liberatory kind of US um, rebellious ideal, and then that gets translated even to um, places like here. So if you actually look, for example, I remember watching when the Berlin Wall uh, fell, how many people <coughs> crossing over it were actually wearing denim. The sort of significance that denim had um, to youth and the idea uh, of rebellion thereafter. Which is fine, so there the are bits of history we can understand, but um, all of, just like I said, you know, indigo once was very important because it was a particular kind of dye, but it isn't now, it's, not long, it's no longer plant indigo, right? We don't, there's nothing special about the, the artificial indigo that we use in these things. And equally, you know, there was a time when Americanization, for example, was very important, but it hasn't been important for quite a while. Um, nobody in the UK wears blue denim because they think it has anything to do with the States today. Um, and when I started working in India on denim, um, the people there didn't know about this history. They had no idea that the jeans had ever been associated. They either thought it was an Indian textile, or so there was a rumour it was a, a German miner for some reason, um, that invented it, etc. But it certainly had nothing to do with the US. So that doesn't hold today. And, and, and that kind of, the other, let me start, the structuralist tradition, um, 
It seems to me that we need to know the history, but I just don't feel that answers the question I start with. I want to know why 50% of the people, or higher than that, who went out in the street this morning, why are they wearing blue jeans? Um, so it, it's useful background, but it's not the whole thing. So what other reasons could you, could you bring to this? Um, well, one of them would be the fact that um, blue jeans are not you know, falling off trees, they're commodities, right? People buy them. And therefore, um, something that social scientists would tend to say is it's a commodity. If you want to understand why it's so common, it obviously has to be capitalism, right? We live under capitalism, therefore we can say everything, you know, um, if blue jeans are, are worn by everybody, it must be capitalism. If your granny's ill, it must be capitalism. You know, whatever's out there, if you live under capitalism, it must be capitalism that is the reason behind this. Um, but there is a problem, I think, about this kind of it must be capitalism argument. Because um, we do use it glibly, I'm not altogether um, joking about it. And um, in this case, what we'd have to ask is, what does it mean to say that? What is implied when you say it is capitalism, that it results in us wearing the blue jeans? Now, depending on many theories of capitalism, but by and large, one assumes that capitalism is something um, designed to increase capital, right? Um, that what people are after in this world of commerce is profitability. Um, and if, therefore, it is capitalism, there has to be an argument that says that the reason this is happening out in the world is because of what it does for that profitability of commerce. Now, let's think about blue jeans, okay? If you are in business and you want to make money out of clothing, what you want is fashion. You want people to believe that this year they can't wear what they were wearing last year. You want things that don't last very long. You want people to feel they have a different garment for every single different case. You want to get them to buy a lot of clothes so you can sell a lot of clothes. And what's the worst garment in the entire planet from that point of view? It has to be blue jeans. They are the least susceptible to... I mean, there is a fashion area of jeans, I don't deny it. But for most of the jeans I'm talking about, they are as far from that as can be. In fact, one of the appeals is precisely the distance it has from those uh, pressures of the fashion. Um, we, we have them, every, all our evidence shows we, we tend to have them longer than any other clothing, we wear them more than any other clothing, we care less if something happens than any other clothing. Commerce does sell jeans, okay, so they, can, they must be making money out of it. But it's not that they are the ones that persuade us to buy the jeans, they, much, they would make much more money if we wore something else. So, no, it isn't capitalism. Capitalism is the context in which these things are made, marketed, and distributed, but it's not causal. There is no argument that we wear blue jeans as opposed to other clothing because of capitalism, quite the reverse. Um, so when people say it's capitalism, let's work out what actually they mean. And in fact, I've got Hugo Boss down there. I remember talking to people in these companies, and I did interview people at Hugo Boss, and, you know, who want to, to sell stuff. And, you know, every year this guy is supposed to produce a new line in denim. And that's really tough. Okay? What is next year's denim as opposed to this year's denim? It's hard work. For, and the designers themselves will tell you that, okay? Um, in that field. Now, if you ask people why they wear denim, the usual immediate answer tends to be functional. Oh, I wear denim because um, it's kind of... Uh, well, a lot of people say it's, it's very good when it's uh, cold. And unfortunately, a lot of other people say it's very good when it's hot. Um, uh, it's cotton. Uh, a lot of people might say, well, it's good, you know, it keeps the rain off you. And then other people say, no, it's terrible when the rain it gets soaked and heavy, etc., etc. So for every functional reason I can find, I can find its opposite um, in the world of explanation, which suggests that this is more to do with legitimation than anything else. Um, so we're not getting it out of commerce, we're not getting it out of um, a function. So, but we're anthropologists. So what do we do in such situations? We think, well, let's do an ethnography or two, right? That's what we do. 
So let's go and do a couple of ethnographies um, and see what that tells us about why people wear denim. And um, one of the ones I'm going to uh, go through this quite quickly, um, but one of the ethnographies I carried out was in Kerala, which you can see from the map is in the um, southwest corner of India. And actually I, I went there because I wanted to be fair. I wanted to study places where denim wasn't very common and explain why, as well as places it was very common. And this actually is a place that's a very low percentage of denim wear. So I thought that would be an interesting kind of contrast. Um, the state I'm working in is this one, Kanor, in the north of um, Kerala. Um, and um, this is a photo I took. Um, whether you actually are aware of Kerala, I do not know. Um, but it's one of the uh, first um, areas to actually democratically elect a communist government, and you may be surprised to know that it keeps on doing it. Um, and this was actually a communist rally uh, while I was, I was working there, um, which is the dominant party in Kerala. Um, but you could ask me. Actually, Kerala in particular is interesting because it's communist, it's also a Muslim area, um, and it was traditionally ruled by a female BB, so it's kind of female Muslim, it's kind of interesting. Uh, anyway, apart from humans. Um, but we'll get to that. Um, and so I started looking at the, the actually, um, jeans is becoming more and more common in India. Um, one of the biggest producers in the world is Arvin Mills, which is in Gujarat. Um, and this was like the most expensive store in the only kind of mall that they have in, in Kembal. Um Now, when we have, when, when anthropologists go out and do an ethnography of clothing, um, typically, this is generalization, the way we do it, stems from the kind of semiotic analysis that we associate with, whether it's poultry or silence, etc., etc. And what we tend to do is we try and look for parameters, differences in the material, and associate it with some other differences of significance. That's kind of what we tend to do. And sure enough, you can go to Kano and you can, and you can do just that. So if you look, for example, at the parameter of age, you find that um, if you look at the, the kiddies, um, the kiddies wear this incredibly kind of bright, gaudy, sort of decorative, interesting looking kind of um, denim. And then you go up to the sort of teenagers, um, they're also wearing denim and it's got some elaboration, it's kind of embroidery, they care a lot about the belts, um, this kind of thing. And then as you get to um, older groups in, in college, uh, etc. You'll find they're wearing entirely plain denim. And then later on, you, you have in India something called executive wear, which is what you wear if you get sort of the right kind of job. And there's absolutely no denim allowed at all, right? So you can see a pretty clear set of transformations going on along denim, which would work for, um, um, for age. Um, I'm not going to have time, but there's also things that go connect up with religion in terms of um, the Muslims are the ones who are getting more money because they, they get a lot of money from the Gulf. Um, so they're seen as a kind of nouveau riche. They wear kind of brighter or goodies, have lots and lots of denim. The Hindus are sort of trying to become drab, really, to sort of contrast themselves with the Muslims in terms of sort of um, kind of uh, social capital that goes with the, those dress. Um, Great time to go with this. Um, there's um, young women will be found wearing denim, um, but there seems to be a pretty much an absolute prohibition against married women wearing um, denim. And which is seen, people kept saying there is a woman somewhere we've heard about who's married and wears denim, but we, we never found her. Right? Um, and actually, somebody was telling me, I was talking to one of my Romanian students, they were saying maybe amongst the Roma here there would be a fairly similar idea that once married it's not appropriate, but somebody else can tell me whether that's the case or not. Um, so again, there's a set of differences you can look at. One reason you might not wear denim is out of respect for your mother, because actually cleaning, de washing denim uh, is not any, it's a very heavy garment when wet, um, it can break your back. Um, I won't even talk about this, um, but it's wrong in so many levels, as we say in England. Um, okay, so the point though is that, um, yes, you could do analysis, and in the, the publication, I particularly talk about the way um, what I think is happening is that in Kenor, people associate denim with the outer, the more metropolitan, the more cosmopolitan world. If you're traveling out of Kenor, you tend to pull on denim. Um, and then when you come back to Kenor, you tend not to. And it's a kind of the rejection of denim in the analysis is the way that kind of people are trying to put a barrier to the sort of the penetration of that outer world 
into the sort of sanctity of Kandor itself. And there is a publication in, in the book I mentioned again called Global Denim if you want to read the details. But what I'm saying is it's a typical kind of ethnography, right? That's the sort of thing we do. Similarly for the next example. This case is from India to Brazil. It's not my uh, research. It's, it's research by somebody called um, Nani Mizrahi. Um, but it's about um, what we call Brazilian genes, right? And Brazilian genes are a very particular kind of denim. Um, Actually, they're not made of proper denim at all. Um, and in Brazil, um, when people are referring to Brazilian genes, the way they will talk about it, they will translate into English and they say, it's a bra for the bum bum, right? It's a bra, that is, it gives you lift, but it gives you lift here instead of here, right? Um, and that's the attraction. And anybody who's been to Brazil know that the Brazilians, above all other people, seem to care an awful lot about their asses, right? Um, and how they look from behind. Um, so this kind of particular concern figures for Brazil. And Milenia Mizraki, she's the person who did the research, um, she gives this history where essentially um, these genes were developed by a particular firm called Ganga, um, and that was kind of uh, making stuff for the kind of nouveau riche um, in places like Rio. And then that gets taken up by a completely different group, as sometimes happens. And in Brazil, um, you may have heard, if you've read about Rio de Janeiro, that they have the favela. And the favela are these kind of ghetto areas that actually penetrate around the city, and it's areas of poverty. And uh, for, the, for the favela, there's a particular kind of style of music associated with them called funk. And funk is... Um, it, uh, these people come down from the favelas into the city, and they hold what are called funk balls. Um, now, for those of us in anthropology who are really in it to find the best parties of the world, um, funk is not bad at all. Not as good as Trinidad, but not bad. Um, and if you go to these parties, you find that um, they wear all sorts of interesting cut-out um, uh, denim like this. And then the Brazilian genes get associated with these people who, in a sense, are iconic now of a certain uh, aspect of Brazilian culture more generally. And then that gets linked... Um, to the more general idea which people, when they think of Brazil, they think of this is a pretty sexy place. Okay? So, therefore, Brazilian genes start getting the connotation of being particularly sexy. And if people from here or from uh, or Paris or whatever buy Brazilian genes, that's really why they're buying genes. Okay. Um, now, you can do these ethnographies in different places, um, but the problem is that we're dealing here with something which is global. And there's an intellectually interesting question of whether our accounting for global phenomena is more than the aggregate of the locals, is it right? How actually do we start relating the evidence of these things into the bigger question? So I want to take you from those kind of approaches to can we say something in general about the presence of denim as a, as a global form? And um, let me take you then to, to another area, um, okay, London. And this is a photograph that you would take in London today um, of people walking down the street. Now, for those of you who, um, who read your newspapers, you would know that the reason for this is because we're currently uh, ruled by somebody called uh, Ceausescu, who doesn't allow us to wear anything else, right? You know that. Um, but actually, right, the point is that these people could, in fact, be wearing anything but they are not. And I've always been interested, uh, even before studying denim, in why not? Why is London like that? And actually, I once wrote another article um, called The Little Black Dress is the Solution, but what's the problem? <laughs> right? Um, and one of, and that, that started a collaboration between myself and somebody who was then a PhD student called Sophie Woodward. And Sophie Woodward um, did a PhD which became published as a book called Why Women Wear What They Wear. And really the idea was to, to, to think about fashion in a very different way. Um, because for us the, kind of, the key thing was what, what Sophie found in her research was her research was based on what you see women wearing out in the street is only part of the story. The other place you really need to be is when they get up in the morning. And Oh, generalization of gender, but never mind. Um, when women, in general, getting up in the morning, it is very common, says Sophie, 
that they will um, put on, at first, actually rather more interesting clothing. A dress, maybe, with a little print and colour and so forth. They'll put it on, they'll go to the mirror, they'll look at themselves, and then they will look at themselves again, and they will take it off. Right? And maybe they might even do it again. But the point is that if they are anxious, or we are anxious, about how we are going to look when we go out into the street, um, then what Sophie found was that what you might call the default clothing is denim. Denim is default clothing. It's, if, you, if, you're, if you can't get it together to wear anything else, at least you could always wear the denim. Right? Um, how the hell she did this field work about all these people getting up in the morning, I never asked her, right? But that's her concern. Anyway, it was partly she was doing that work. I was doing, meanwhile, I'd written a paper called Fashion and Anxiety, which was very much the same principle, where I was saying, you know, how is it that one gets up in the morning, you open a wardrobe, you've got 70 things you could wear, and the first thing you say is, my God, I can't go out, I have nothing to wear, kind of feeling, right? Um, so we then worked, decided to work together then, to look at anxiety as an issue around um, clothing choices. So, if you start to look at you're starting to get interesting things going on here. On the one hand, um, there is the global ubiquity. Why this and only this um, has that kind of presence? Why is it in London for these women default clothing, and for men often too? And then there was a third element that we thought was kind of interesting. Um, and that is this, that if you go to the shop out here, right, go to the high street, you go into a shop, and you see some clothing you want to buy. Um, and it's, a, I don't know, a suit or a dress or something, and you look at it, and then you find it's got a stain on it, right? It's got a stain on it. Um, it's, it's actually looking a bit faded. Um, it's been torn. Um, what are you going to do? You're going to take it to the system and say, I am no way I'm going to buy that. Right? I'm not buying a stained, torn, faded bit of cloth here. Unless, of course, it's denim. Right? Denim, people will go in and precisely they will find clothing that is ripped and torn and stained and all the rest of it, and they will um, buy that clothing. And pretty much, it is only denim. I mean, very few other garments does that, does that ever really become true of. It's essentially a denim thing. Now, to explain this, um, you're going to have to use your... I'm going to talk about this personally, right? In terms of my own personal history. And um, you have to go back to a time, and I, I apologise for the visuals here, right? Um, I'm wearing purple, it's not just purple, they're big flares, okay? Big flare trousers. Um, I've got my uh, beads, uh, my shirt has flowers all over it, and my hair is longer than pretty much anybody here, right? Um, the story is basically about getting stoned. Um, however, just to set right, I'm not talking about me, right? I'm talking about the denim. Why did denim get stoned? Um, and the reason was that um, when we, of that particular group, used to go and wear our denim, um, we just wore it and wore it and wore it and wore it. We didn't have much money, etc. And we, we started to feel that sense that, you know, it softens, it becomes very personal, very, very personal. Your jeans, you didn't care so much about any other clothes, but you really cared about your jeans, right? And you cared about them that you just couldn't bear not to be wearing that pair of jeans. After all this time, they're just getting better and better and better. They might be getting torn, people can see whatever, but, you know, you, they're really nice. And to be honest, people like us at that time, unless your mother or your girlfriend burnt them, you carried on wearing them, right? Um, they, because they had this particular kind of relationship to you. And you realise that actually of all the clothes that we wear, there's a sense in which jeans are, have the capacity to become the most intimate, not underwear really, because you don't tend to personalise your underwear to your body, or at least I don't. Um, but your genes, there is a sense that, that, that over time it becomes uniquely, in a sense, related to you as an individual um, and, your, and, and, that, and that kind of experience of wearing this particular gene over that period of time. And that, of course, is why the genes got stoned. Stoned means um, the first form of distressing for denim was um, washing them with stones. Okay? 
um, stoneware, stonewashing. And then later on, after stonewashing, um, which, which gave them the abrasion and the softness, etc., as though somebody had worn them. And you have this weird thing today where, you know, workers in, in Turkey or elsewhere sort of almost lose a part of their life because they're dealing with dangerous chemicals, which are used so that you can buy a pair of jeans that looks like it's already had a life. Um, and it's something I've written about elsewhere. But um, one of the things is that when you have like one weird thing, that's just a weird thing. When you have two or three weird things, they start to maybe kind of relate together. And if you take about the things I've just described, um, the, the point I've made is that um, um, it's global more than any other garment. Okay, it's default, and it's also intimate. And one of the things I would suggest that we're going to have to rush a bit is that um, this is not a coincidence. That actually, what you have in denim is something which um, speaks to being of the world. If you want to feel, you know, given that we see the newspapers, the news, we have this sense of the globe. If you want to feel you're a part of that and you're a citizen of that, and you're living somewhere in China or, or wherever, um, wearing denim situates you in that in a way no other garment possibly does. But it also simultaneously speaks to this idea of being incredibly personal and uh, of you. And the problem in social science theory is to reconcile how do we, as it were, manage to associate ourselves with that vastness of the global without the loss, the alienation, that comes of being dissipated into that vastness. How do we retain the sense of the individual and the personal within that? Is there something that can do both simultaneously? So the foundation for the argument about the ubiquity of denim is, starts there that actually we think maybe denim is important because it does that for us today. It's both unbelievably intimate, potentially, and also global, and helps us reconcile the contradictions between those two things. So at that point, um, we wrote a paper called, um, we were just thinking this is getting really, really interesting, we didn't know where it was going to go, um, but, um, <coughs> but as it got more and more interesting, we thought, well, we really need a lot more work around denim. So we wrote a paper um, in social anthropology called a Manifesto for the Study of Denim. And we decided that what we wanted was um, to think about other new ways you could actually go about anthropological studies. And one of them was that, you know, normally a PhD student comes to you and, and they say, well, I want to study this, but I'm worried in case somebody else is also studying it, right? It's like, this has to be my territory and my territory alone. If anybody else is there, I, I've got to find something else to study, right? Um, it's, it's not okay. Um, well, what, I, what if you just turn the whole thing around? Um, we're supposed to be social anthropologists? Be social. Um, actually say, why don't kind of as many of us as possible study the same thing at the same time, right? And so we can, we've got something to speak about. Mutual interest, conversation, um, etc. So we thought, we were thinking like you know, open source kind of idea, because I'm useless at getting any money. So by default, I'm open source. Right? There's no funding for anything I'm talking about today. Um, so, um, so we just set up, um, we then, what we did is we went to our website at the university, and we, 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 decided, we called ourselves the Global Denim Project, right? Because like, nobody could stop us. Um, so we just put it there, Global Denim Project. We said, Anybody out there who wants to come and uh, study denim, we're going to be studying denim for at least the next five years. Um, we hope a lot of other people will do that, and then at least we can discuss this. You know, anthropology is also supposed to be comparative. Let's do it. Let's have comparative anthropology with lots of different kind of things going on there. We don't have any money. Uh, the website's free. Um, but, you know, we have goodwill, whatever you want to call it. Um, so we did that. And actually, there was a very good response to this kind of open source anthropology. And um, if you can read that, um, but come on, so you short. Um, the first book that came out from, of the Denim Project was one called Global Denim, came out about a year ago. Um, and it really was great because all these different people were doing all these incredibly different things around denim. People were looking at denim uh, production and uh, uh, export processing zones in Egypt. 
um, and the problems of, of people trying to sell them in street markets in, in Brazil. People were looking at why it's actually important for recycling because of its iconic character in the US. Um, uh, Comstock was giving a very different history from the history I gave earlier. Um, we've got things on, um, uh, uh, on genes and sex in Milan, and if you've ever been to Milan, you know why. Um, and on um, hip hop youth in, in Berlin, etc. So, just in a sense, there's a kind of random process, you've got all sorts of interesting complementary things going on. Um, and I won't talk to that, but um, one of them, a good example of that is one of my fabulous students from here. Um, called uh, Magda Krashen, who um, was working on fake brands in Istanbul. And this is actually fake Victoria Beckhams from the, um, from the bazaar in Istanbul, um, from her work. Okay, so as a, we're doing all this, but also, as an anthropologist, um, you, can't, you don't feel comfortable doing this unless you also carry out a traditional ethnography um, of your own. Not just these slighter pieces of work, but, you know, the real, um, for us in material culture, it's very important when the, the, the quality of the field work is as good as anybody's, right? So the idea was that we would also spend our 15 months um, on a site in, in London and just study the particular relationship to blue jeans. So Sophie and I um, set up to do that. We found some streets in, in North London. I, uh, for my other work, you might know that I, the technique I tend to use is this street study. And I like street studies in London because the idea, we've got to this place where, you know, people tend to be studying, um, people do studies of uh, the working class, or of women, or of Somalis, etc. And the problem has always been for me, is like, if you start off saying that studies about women, and then at the end of the day you say, you know, what was really interesting that came out of my study was gender, it's like, well, what kind of do you expect, given that's where you're coming from? So there is a sense in which I think the idea of trying to do a study where you actually do not start with any salient parameters, you just let it arise from the material, um, is something I prefer to do. So I tend to take these streets in London, which is a very heterogeneous place, and knock on doors and work with whoever happens to be there, which is what we did in this particular. There's three little streets who are all connected together. So we start our ethnography of, um, of uh, genes. And actually, as you hope, I thought it was all going to be out about anxiety. It wasn't. Um, it started to drift into completely different directions, which we hadn't previously thought about. Um, and which I'm, so everything I'm talking about now really just comes from that experience of doing the ethnography. Um, some of it more obvious, some of it, I never think, one of those things that's only obvious after you've said it, uh, which is really what you want um, in this kind of work. So we're working with these people, and we're, uh, we're trying to look at their wardrobes and understand them and talk to them about their relationship to denim, etc. And um, to start with the thing, what is it that people say most about denim? What is the reason they give? What is, what is the term for their relationship to, to denim? And the word that is most commonly used, in this, in, as we found in this research, is the word comfort. Um, and... Um, what I should say is this, um, this piece of research is actually complete. It's coming out as a book called uh, Blue Jeans, The Art of the Ordinary. And what's really nice about it is it's coming out with the University of California Press, which we felt given it's about Blue Jeans. Which kind of cool. um, so um, in that is a chapter about comfort. And comfort will turn out to be a very good example um, of what in social science tends to call naturalization which is how do, how do we, in, every, in everyday life, elide things which seem, as it were, actually natural um, and bring more and more of cultural legitimation um, to bear on that baseline, that foundation of what appears to be natural and common sense. And you can certainly see that in terms of this idea of comfort, because basically um, what you start with <laughs> is that people say, it's comfortable, you know, it feels good on the body, it's soft, um, I, I, I can get the right kind of fit, um, I sort of, you know, um, look, you know, it's, it's got all that, it's comfortable, um, it's cotton, etc. And then you go from there, and people start telling you, well, you know, it's, it's such an easy thing, because actually, it turns out people wash it less than they do other kinds, they don't feel the compulsion to wash 
jeans as often as they do, other kinds of clothing. Um, you don't have to think about it so much. It lasts a long time, etc., etc. So people often use the word comfort. What they really meant is it's just easy. It's kind of easy to live with. It does all these kinds of things. And then as you go on, you find, well, people actually, half the time what they're saying is, well, the reason I wear jeans is, um, you know, I'm going out to a party and I want to feel comfortable. Um, and what they're saying is they don't want to feel uncomfortable, right? And the idea that the issue of self-consciousness, that people would look at you, that people would make judgments about you, etc., becomes the idea of, of, of discomfort, of feeling uncomfortable. Um, but comfort here is basically a sense of oneself in the public domain. It's got nothing to do with anything physical, but people constantly aligned those kind of ideas. And actually, you can see more and more it's about trying to, to not feel self-conscious. And you get to the point where somebody will say, oh yeah, I wear, um, you know, sore thumb jeans. Now, sore thumb jeans uh, are jeans that basically, you know, skinny jeans, right? Well, skinny jeans, but then go down a bit. These are the jeans where um, you're on the changing room in your shop, you have to lie down, right, and use your thumbs, and your thumbs get sore, just getting that kind of button done up, right? That's sore thumb jeans, right? Not what we might otherwise think of as comfortable. But in this context, because this word comfort has such semantic reach, you can see the way these things are being brought together. Okay. Now, what I want to do is, is start going up to more sort of analytical kind of levels. Um, and we work on this area of comfort, and then we start to find something else out about genes. Um, if you remember before, I said the conventional way you do an ethnographic analysis around something like this is this kind of semiotic analysis, where you're trying to find differences in material as opposed to differences in the people. <coughs> Now, when we started to look more in detail about um, the way genes are worn by people in the street, several things followed. First, um, of course, the problem of generalising about something that is half the world's clothes is, 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 a di is difficult. But you can, because there are particular kinds of genes. There are skinny genes, and boyfriend genes, and designer genes, and, and uh, expensive branded genes. And a lot of the people on the street, not a lot, but some anyway, do have these genes in their wardrobe. But these tend to be special occasion genes. What we found was that in terms of what people wear every day, those are not the genes, apart from maybe teenagers, most people are not wearing those genes. The big expansion in the genes market, the thing that accounts for the fact that so many people wear genes today, is these are incredibly cheap jeans. The big sellers of jeans are places like Asda Supermarket, which is actually Walmart, um, or Primark, for those of you, do you get Primark here? I don't know which things get here. I mean, like, this is like eight, 10 pounds. Uh, so that's what, um, 30, it's, it's not much money, right? Um, and um, people, half the time, you know, instead of what brand is your jeans? And they just, they actually didn't know. They didn't even know if it has a brand. They don't necessarily even know where they bought it from. And they are not necessarily tightly fitted or anything like that. And women as well, it's not like Milan, it's not like Brazil. Um, women in London are wearing really very kind of um, ordinary, not particularly baggy, not particularly tight, just regular. Kept, people get talking about regular jeans, ordinary jeans, right? Um, and that is the bulk of what people are wearing day by day, and that's the genes I'm primar primarily interested in. And what you find is that increasingly, they didn't, you know, we're saying, how do I do what I did in Canada? How can I fit something like age to the genes? Um, so you start thinking about it, well, which age is appropriate for wearing genes? And the problem you find is that um, people talk about, I mean, I'll give you a quote of it somewhere here from, um, yeah. Um, somebody says, um, my husband was crazy. As soon as my son was born, he went out and bought him some jeans that were his size. They were so uncomfortable for a baby. He wanted to see his son in jeans straight away. So he had this big nappy and this little bottom, and he looked really strange. My sister kept saying, you're silly, don't be silly. The only thing babies should be in is a baby grill or something. We bought him designer ones. I think it was some really expensive, I don't know, Love Polar, Loren, something or other kind of things. And, you know, he's not, he's not, he's not even walking. And um, there's a six months and he grows out of them straight away. I mean, what, what's the point in all this? But 
the point, as far as we're concerned, there clearly is no age too young that you can't wear jeans. And you've got somebody else coming along, and he say, he's also saying, he's saying, oh, my husband, he's, I think, like 61 or 63 or whatever, I don't know what it was. And, you know, oh, but he's, he's you know, he's, he, he will walk along and he will say, you know, look at me, my body's still, you know, pretty good. Um, I look amazing and, you know, look at these jeans on me. And, and, you know, if you ever want to make an advert about an older person wearing jeans, I'm the person who should be in your advert, right? You know? And the idea being that basically, it doesn't matter what age, now a lot of the, if you go to the site 70s, they weren't wearing jeans previously. It's really come in the last um, uh, one or two decades. But, in other words, you can't be too old to wear jeans. You can't be too young to wear jeans. The jeans that we're talking about um, are the less gendered, as it were, um, in terms of because the looks are basically fairly uh, nondescript. Um, and, as we said, the, the, the expensive ones, I mean, you, you, you could not, I mean, England's often talked about in terms of class, but I challenge you to go out into a London street, see the first person wearing jeans, and tell me anything about education, income, or whatever about that person. Um, it's as likely to be the maid as the mistress wearing the sort of Swarovski crystal kind of stuff on their, on their jeans, right? So um, the jeans basically don't talk to that. So we kept asking people, well, when, who can't wear jeans? When can't you wear jeans? The answer is there isn't anybody who can't wear jeans, basically. The only thing people finally came up with is they said people who are very, very overweight. Right? That we don't really like to see them in jeans, was something that people said to me. Any of you ever been to the US? You will know that's not true in the US. Um, and increasingly is probably becoming less true elsewhere. But if, it, if it's there, it's about the last thing left um, about who, as it were, cannot, should not be seen, as it were, or look good in jeans. It's anybody. Um, and that, if you, if you look at when you can't wear jeans, again, um, really, the only thing people said consistently was weddings. It's really not good to wear uh, jeans at a wedding. Slightly less so funerals, and there was a lot of argument about churches. Um, and so, Jehovah's Witness, maybe not. Um, Muslims, for example, if you, you can have jeans, it's more a question of how tight they are, but if you've got a long uh, kurta, uh, chemise, over, and it, it covers the sort of body-hugging area, then it's probably okay. Um, so, very few occasions, um, but if you look at that and also you look at work, it's like, um, the problem with work is if you are somebody who has to serve the public in an official capacity, then often it's seen that jeans are not seen as appropriate. And to cut a long story short, it's basically, jeans represent the unmarked. If you, if you want to show you are making a special effort, or, it, 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 or that this is different, or it's a very dressed up thing, then jeans, by definition, would not be appropriate because the marking is represented by wearing something else. But for all other elements, you can wear jeans. So the point is that the kind of analysis we would conventionally do on jeans doesn't work. Um, and increasingly, I found myself using a term for uh, denim which was post-semiotic. Now, Webb Keynes, a friend of mine, is an expert on, on semiotic, semi, you know, semiotics, um, would gladly cut my throat for this because, as he points out, technically you can't have a post-semiotic. It would at least always signify that there isn't anything else, uh, and that would still be signified. Um, and Webb Keynes is absolutely right. But it seemed to me that compared to everything else we meant by semiotic, post-semiotic makes the point strongly enough to be worth playing with. So technically incorrect, but um, it actually sums up a lot of what I think is going on here. That there is nobody who can't wear jeans, and as long as the occasion doesn't have to be that marked special occasion, it can be any, any place, any, any kind of where, any kind of time. Which again is an extraordinary thing about, about these jeans. And one of the ways, in a sense, that also came up was, you know, the, the other reason people would give is to why, why do you wear jeans? And people would say again and again that um, the reason I wear blue jeans is this. Um, anything goes with blue jeans, right? You, if you want to accessorize it, you want to wear other clothes with it, you know, shoes, whatever it is. If you've got other clothes, you've got to think about matching and getting it right. 
The nice thing about genes is that anything goes with blue genes. So it's a really great thing to pick because it solves a lot of problems, arterial problems, about what we wear, okay, when we go out. So everything goes with genes. Um, and, you know, why are you asking me these questions? That's kind of obvious that everything goes with genes. So, fine, we do that. And I apologise and said, well, you know, very interested to hear this. But, you know, I'm a bit stupid and I just need to just clarify a couple of things here. And so I said, can you explain to me, um, okay, everything goes with blue genes. So, this colour blue, this indigo <coughs> colour blue, um, if you had another kind of, uh, like corduroy trousers or something else, in exactly the same colour as, as this, right? So you're wearing those trousers in that indigo colour. Can you wear anything with that? And they think about it and say, of course you can't wear anything with corduroy trousers in blue. No, I mean, you're stupid, you know, uh, blue jeans you can wear, but no, can't do that. So I said, okay. And then, if you have um, a pair of denim, you know, absolutely identical, exactly the same denim, pink. Right? Green, whatever. Um, could you wear anything with that? Pink denim? No, you can't wear everything with pink denim. No way. So, okay. Um, the implication of this is that for anthropologists who, who were brought up in the notion of culture as the arbitrary, you couldn't get a neater example than this. There is absolutely not an effing thing about blue jeans, right? that is the reason why anything goes with it. It's not the denim, it's not the blue. It is only because they are blue jeans, and what that tells you is, once again, that blue jeans are post-semiotic. Because they are nothing, symbolically, then there is nothing for things not to go with. That's why everything can go with them, right? because they have achieved that state of utter nothingness um, that allows everything to go in. So as far as I'm concerned, these people are telling me what, I'm, what we're, me and Sophie, what we're coming up with, but seen in terms of their discourse about the genes. Okay, so we're starting to move up now, analytically, okay, to having these kind of ideas about the, the I was about to say, the significance of non-significance, whatever you want to call it, about blue genes. But then let's take it up another level. Um, why does this matter? So what? Um, well, actually, I think a lot of things I've talked about already in terms of um, how it resolves issues of anxiety, etc., etc., are important. But, but there is something else here, which is that what genes really seem to express better than anything else is a notion of just being ordinary. And eventually, the word that came to dominate our research and our publications in the research comes to be this word, ordinary. Now, what's extraordinary about ordinary? Right? Why does that matter? Now, one of the things I haven't mentioned is who the hell I'm talking about in this street. It's a London street. London streets are almost inevitably very heterogeneous places. I didn't know who was going to be living there, but what I found out was this is not typical, in the bucket, but no street in London ever is. Um, population in the street, right? And particularly from South Asia. But I don't want to, I want to be careful when I say it's South Asian migrants, because actually I work in South Asia. And as far as people from South Asia are concerned, um, somebody from Bangladesh or a Buddhist from Sri Lanka, or, um, or a Hindu from India, etc., or Pakistani, you know, it's like saying they come from Europe. These are highly differentiated places. And as long as you respect that differentiation, you would say of this street, like most streets in London, there are no <coughs> dominant minorities. London is, a, is unusual in terms of its demographics, um, in that we used to have concentrations of minorities, but while some cities like New York still does, London does not. Actually, uh, only like 3% of the population of London live in an area which is kind of uh, demographically sees a particular concentration of people from a particular area. It's actually those, those areas are very, very dispersed in, 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 in London today. Even places like Brixton and South London, etc. It used to be more concentrated, much less so today. And I won't deny that there is something about London that is obviously going to be true for the interpretation of the ethnography and the particularities. And a lot of this is calped in a way that it's as though people have to make a kind of choice. 
either you are associated with or you associate yourself with the place that you came from, your ancestry, those traditions, or you associate yourself with um, or are associated with the place that you now live in, the host country. Um, and the political discourse tends to be pivoted around those kind of problematic dualisms. Meanwhile, back at the street, they're wearing blue jeans. Now, the point about blue jeans is that, as I said at the beginning, it is not just London where half the population wears blue jeans. Wherever people are coming from today, the chances are that blue jeans are extremely common, regular attire of that place. All right? If you come as a migrant and wear blue jeans in London, that doesn't make you Londoner. It, it doesn't make you British. Um, but it doesn't dissociate you from Pakistan or from the Caribbean or whatever. Quietly, it gets on with the job right? of being ordinary. So that when you talk to the people, you find that actually, if you take some of the older migrants, there were a few people um, of an older age group who will say that, yeah, when I came here, I felt a kind of pressure to not wear something else and maybe put on blue jeans. But that's very, very rare. And it tends to be only the older ones. Most people today, um, you wear jeans because it's like whatever. Um, you wear jeans, um, essentially the same reasons that other people are wearing jeans. We had one, um, I mean, jeans obviously used to be semiotic. They used, in the 1950s, we have stories of women being beaten up because they were wearing jeans. Um, they used to have, but grand, and there was a time when they were associated, you know, one of the, my informants was police, and he said, yeah, you know, like 20 years ago, we might have looked out for people wearing jeans, and, you know, followed them, wondered about them. Today, no way. I mean, today, jeans tell you nothing, all right? They are just ordinary, and um, they've lost all of that. Um, and that is what actually makes it work. So people um, will wear them because at school, you don't want your kids quarrelling about, you know, who's got better this and who's got better that and who spent more of it. And they've abolished uniforms, which actually the parents hate, because it stopped all that kind of fighting. So let everybody wear blue jeans, you know? Students... Um, well, you remember my first slide. It's, it's, it's the land of happy blue jeans, right? Um, and later on, it relaxes, it's leisure, it, it deals with all these kind of problems, um, you wear blue jeans. So to quote from one of my migrants, actually a really interesting person, because just by coincidence, um, it turned out it was a family who came from West Africa, and it's one of the few areas where people still grow plant indigo, and, and, and the mother of this person had actually been involved in, the, in indigo plantation, which we thought was just great. Um, and then she talks about you know, the periods of how she wore them there and what she wears here. Um, but, but when she's talking about her jeans today, this is a typical quote from the research. She says, OK, um, the jeans she has a real attachment for and identification with are the ones she's worn for 10 years. They become soft and intimate and personal. More than just physically comfortable, they genuinely contribute to her ability to feel relaxed. But one also senses they're part of the way she feels comfortable in the wider social sense was just another person living in a certain North London area. She retains her marked cultural identity for those occasions when she feels this is appropriate, such as a family wedding. Her husband is a Jehovah's Witness, and she does not wear jeans for church. But in her everyday life, she's content to have lost any particular regional affiliation or identity, to be mother and wife, but also to have her own career, and above all, her own personality. In most respects, she regards herself as having achieved a state of merely ordinary though she does not reflect much on the struggle to achieve that state. So the chapter that is concerned with migrants is called The Struggle to Become Ordinary. Um, where ordinary represents a, a, a very particular kind of achievement. I mean, to take this at its most extreme, I think one of the interesting things about London is that London is great for, as it were, not worrying about... I mean, we go out and study... There's been a sort of fashion for studying identity. Right? And it's as though everybody wants this. But I find in London, it's often a place where people will come from, I don't know, uh, well, Denmark actually was a case, um, or, or Poland or, some, or Brazil, and, um, and you know, you're not the politics, you can't, 
there's a, in the book, The Comfort of Things, I've got a case where um, there's this Brazilian, and I find he's Brazilian, and I'm at politics. I say, oh, do you eat all these Brazilian food? And, and, and do you listen to Brazilian music? And um, do you mainly mix with Brazilians? And he turns to me at one point, and he says, you know, if I wanted to be fucking Brazilian, I'd have stayed in fucking Brazil. Um, London is where you don't have to be that or any other thing. And you can play with this. You can be maybe at certain moments, etc. But it's also a place where, in a sense, if you do not want to identify with identity, then blue jeans and London does it. Right? And that, to me, is important. Um, time's getting on. Uh, and I promised you that we'd go to the top. So let's, um, let's go there. You do all these studies, and then you want to know um, what is the significance for somebody who's not interested in blue jeans at all, um, but is interested in the, the wider field of anthropology. And let me briefly give two of my top-level stories. Um, as I was doing this work, it start, I started to think, well, does this actually challenge not just things like the semiotic and others, but is there a way in which it challenges the way I have been taught to think as an anthropologist? Is there something here about the material culture contribution to the, to the foundations of anthropological thought? And the way I thought it through was I thought, well, actually, the really interesting thing that comes up here is that if there is a central spine to the history of anthropology, to the way we think about social reproduction generally, then it probably revolves around the concept of normativity. Now, normativity is basically saying that when I make a statement about, let's say, what you're wearing or doing or yeah. something about you. There's all, it's not just a statement, but usually our statements to each other have an element of the judgmental. Um, is this appropriate or inappropriate? Is it okay or not okay? And we're constantly wanting to know whether we are or we're not, or somebody else is or is not. And that assumption of our normativity um, for us, is the way in any given society people, as it were, interact with each other, and it's almost like the mechanism, as it were, that makes people understand what is or is not appropriate um, in terms of the way they behave in that kind of given situation. Um, and it comes into anthropology in, in an interesting way, in the sense that the, the concept of normativity, I think, is firstly really explicitly thought about, perhaps in... Um, um, in philosophical tradition with the work of Immanuel Kant. And what I'm referring to here is not, I mean, he, I can't, I don't know if you know, did a book called Anthropology, it's actually a really rubbish book. But, um, and that's not actually the bit that's tended to be influential. It's more the moral philosophy, where um, the argument is, you know, what leads us to, to be, to have judgment, um, um, to be born, what is the place of reason and other things in that? Not going into details, but, but um, there's a nice article by Gregory, Gregory Schrem looking at the way Kantian ideals influence people like Boaz, which then feeds into the, the American tradition, and Durkheim, which feeds into the European tradition. And um, in both cases, they're bringing this kind of sense of normativity, but they're also doing something. There's a rupture from that philosophical tradition because what they're bringing is cultural relativism. That is to say, instead of the universalism of Kantian ideas of the normative and, uh, and, and morality, the idea is this is specific to the particular population which we are studying and of which we generalize. Right? Um, so it's a culture, but within, so we don't judge as outsiders. We're the anthropologists, we don't, you know, they can do whatever they like. Um, we don't judge them, but we expect them to judge them um, in terms of what they do. Now, in anthropology, as it's developed, um, there are certain areas where the issue of the normative remains relatively explicit. So anthropology of religion, so anthropology of law. But it's there throughout. Um, if you do kinship, and you talk about the mother's brother, then that means that there's an expectation that that's what a mother's brother will do. Right? It is implicitly a normative idea. That if a mother's brother doesn't do what a mother's brother should do, somebody's going to say so. Right? And this continues through in, in different variants as the backbone to, to anthropology. If you look at Geertz's work on, on concepts of culture, so much of this, and it gets more explicit in his later work, is on the consensual sense of the normative. Because if you don't want functionalism and you don't want those kind of explanations, then in a sense it's normativity you treat to. And this becomes more interesting still when you get to things like practice theory. Because um, practice theory, it, it, 
goes much more into that kind of everydayness of what people do. So the question is, how then do they judge each other as appropriate? And I'm not going to have time to go into it, but I will, I've written about it. Um, no, no, things that well, no, there was actually a whole um, area called the philosophy of social science. And in that, there's been a whole lot of debates recently about the concept of the normative. And they're associated, particularly, there's a recent book by somebody called um, Stephen Turner, and he argues with this guy, Joseph Rouse. And Turner is trying to understand, you know, normative always means that we, we need to understand, in a sense, why we're doing it. So he has a long section, for example, about the man we have. And he says, uh, you know, either they have an understanding of how the how for example, gets you to sort of do things in a particular way, or if they don't, then Mouse comes up with, with it, as it were. But you have to have that reasoning. Whereas Rouse comes along and says, no, actually, in, in practice theory, it, you don't need the idea that anybody is bothered to have come up with a kind of explanatory idea behind it. It's more like um, being comfortable. So if, in, if you come to London, right, you go to a restaurant, and you have dessert before you have your main course, it's not like you've made a moral crime, right? But you kind of would make people feel a bit uncomfortable. It's not fun um, to do it in that way. So there's a lot of discussion about kind of what, how that kind of works. Now, to me, all that leads actually to the world of material culture. And one of the reasons material culture is so important and interesting. Because if you look at the analysis that I've been carrying out, um, what I'm arguing is that these genes have really interesting consequences. Um, from the world of everyday life and anxiety and going out day to day, to how we think about uh, migration and the relationship between immigrants and societies, to things I haven't even talked about, about egalitarianism, etc., etc., that you can think about. Um, there are all sorts of interesting things going on there, but they're not, um, it's not normative. It's not like if you don't wear jeans, I'm going to say something to you and say, well, look at you as though you should be, right? Um, it doesn't seem to work in that way. So one of the points I'm making is I think that the, given that we, normativity has become such an implicit reasoning within the practice of anthropology, maybe one of the things that comes out of this kind of material culture study is that we want to make it explicit and show there are alternative ways um, in which, whether you want to call it social reproduction, etc., but there are terms of ways in which society works in relation to the stuff around it that does not actually necessarily depend on the concept of normativity as we have always been using it in anthropology. And to that extent, it possibly represents a challenging idea in terms of the fundamental theoretical <coughs> foundations for a discipline like anthropology, coming out of material culture. Um, to take it all the way to the top, um, I also suggest that it would be nice, really, is if we can start with this kind of stuff and say not only challenges anthropology, but it challenges the central spine to, the, to Western philosophy, right? Um, and I think it does. Um, and the reason I think it does goes back to what I was just saying about Kant. Because when you're talking about Kant, or whether you're talking about Hegel, or any of the, the, that kind of core uh, trajectory of philosophical thinking that we are heirs to, um, those philosophers, I suppose the way we tend to bracket them as a group is that this was the Enlightenment. And what does Enlightenment mean? Um, what do these philosophers represent as Enlightenment? Many different versions, but the one I want to draw your attention to really comes back to the point that Kant was making about moral philosophy in the first place, and is then true in the subsequent philosophers. And what they're saying is that people who did things just out of customary reasons, I just, why do you do it? I don't know, I just do it, right? That isn't really enlightened. Um, what philosophy has to bring to the world as enlightenment is a different engagement with moral action. That basically, that we do things with intentionality. Then we know that we are doing this and we intend to do it. We are doing it with consciousness. We understand what we are doing. And above all, therefore, we are doing it in relation to reason. Which will bring us to, if I can't, moral action. If allowed to do so. Alright? Now... Many variants, and I'm not necessarily staying with Kant. 
But the point I'm making is that that philosophical tradition represents morality as effectively something that either has or should emerge out of um, those characteristics of consciousness and intentionality and so forth. But then think about what I've said about material culture, and specifically in this case, blue jeans. It's not like that. The consequences I'm drawing attention to are not coming to Imagine a scene, right? Here I am, proud father, right? And there is my son, you know, and, I, and my heart is filled, right, with sentimental. And I, and I put my hand on his shoulder and I say, my, my son, when you grow up, I want you to be ordinary. <coughs> it doesn't work, right? It's not the way it is. It doesn't have that sense of kind of moral imperative behind it. Um, it doesn't have um, that consciousness. If it is doing these things that I claim it's doing, it's not because people are going out on the street and I am wearing blue jeans today because I want it to do those things. Most of the time I'm making arguments from analytical work that me and Sophie have been doing um, and that are not derived from anything the people are saying. We're trying to understand why they wear them, but they don't know. In the same way that when I started this, I didn't know, and I wear them. Um, so, to my mind, there is actually quite an interesting challenge here, um, all the way up to the top. And I want to finish, really, by saying that what I, I said at the very beginning, I didn't want to give you a whole lot of um, claims around what material culture can do. What I wanted to do was to try and give you an example of what I think material culture can do. And what I hope it delivers in terms of that general aspiration of anthropology as a discipline comes back to that sense of extremism. That basically it grounds you in the stuff. It, it, it grounds you because you can't but see that that's what people do. You didn't ask them to do it, you didn't choose to study as it were. It's just there. It is that kind of grounds, and you have to be fully engaged with it. We get down and dirty, as it were. Um, and that's what we in anthropology do. But we also want to deliver from that experience of what is going on at every level we can, right up to the most philosophical. And we want to do it in a way where you can see how the script is written how the narrative unfolds, how the stages contribute one to the other, so there is plausibility in the final juxtaposition between the most basic stuff you're looking at and the most universal, the most generalised. And that basically is the point. Thank you. Imagine that. 
Um, let's say it was that other kind of that other kind of world. Would it actually impact on the story that I am telling? Could you could it be a socialist world um, without any of that, in which most people wear blue jeans? And I would think the answer is pretty obviously sure it could be. It absolutely could be. Um, I don't know because we don't have it, but um, and we can't really extrapolate from the socialism that did exist because it didn't really exist in the sense of what we might think of otherwise as socialism. God, this is something we may have to argue about for the next 20 years, so I've got to be careful. But, um, but, um, and, and similarly with issues of class. Um, one of the points, it's the same way that I refuse to go out there and study class or women or etc. Et you do that, you go out there and you come up and you say, it's class. Well, often it is. I mean, let me give you an example. When I started my study of shopping, I really tried to not make it about gender. I absolutely didn't want it to be, because I knew that's all the stereotypes. <laughs> The books that I wrote about shopping are all about gender, and it's absolutely central, and there's no way you're going to get away from it, because that seems absolutely clear from the evidence that I've got. But I think that you've also got to be open to the possibility that it isn't, and that's how I think we want to engage in our work. So, um, there are, I mean, I study commerce all, you know, all the time. I try and I look at the campaigns, and I look at the marketing, and I look at class, and I look at class relations in all these things, and I do lots of other studies where I would say that's how I understand that world. But the world is, the world that we live in, the world that anthropology study is manages to transcend the terms that we use, including, I would say, the term capitalism, and including the word class. There's all sorts of other things going on there, and genes are actually interesting <coughs> because of the degree they speak. And if you want to find class, you know, first thing, I'm sure I can find a society where um, denim wearing is rigidly defined by class. I'm sure there are societies out there where that would be true. I'm sure there are societies where the only reason people wear denim is because of some brilliant marketing campaign, etc., etc., that was waiting to do that. But on the ethnography that I'm dealing with, um, I would say it's absolutely not the case. That, that was kind of my point. Oh, sorry. Yeah. restrain myself. Uh, most of all, I'm interested, okay, let's, let me go up as you just did uh, right now at the end. I'm interested in what you think about the relationship between material culture and cognitive science. And why I'm asking this is most of the stuff that you talked about, particularly at the end, is stuff that people cannot verbalize, right? They do not know why they wear jeans. Uh, and since you mentioned Stephen Turner and his critique of practice theory, particularly the reproduction of practice, and he's someone who engages with cognitive science and thinks that the current sociology doesn't make sense without some sort of conversation with that other side of the story. Uh, what if you would take a different narrative of normativity, one that is based on, let's say, Gabriel Tarr and the laws of limitation and not Duquesne? Like I mean, okay, um, let me again be very down the line. I absolutely do not engage with cognitive science. I see absolutely no reason whatsoever to engage with cognitive science. I think it has practically nothing to contribute at all to the things we're talking about. So let's be clear, okay? Um, and the reason for that is this, that um, you said these people are not verbalising around these genes. Absolutely true. But I am, and they could be. I do lots of other studies where um, the relationship between material culture and other forms of discourse is completely different from what I've been studying. Um, I've been studying material culture for a long time and I've seen every kind of linkage and non-linkage between different discursive levels you can imagine. Um, and I don't believe that, that any of these are in some sense more aligned with some propensity that we have as cognitive beings than any other, I just don't. Um, it seems to me that um, in cultural anthropology, you find these extraordinary differences and diversities in the way these kind of things are made. So, I'm interested in the fact that they don't, but I certainly am not claiming that they can't. Um, I think that I have made other studies where it's all about trying to express materially something that has arisen essentially in language or in some other kind of discursive area. Um, I just don't get it when it comes to cognitive science, and indeed, I work obviously with, with uh, evolutionary, uh, bio, 
in, even if you have problems in my department. And I'm equally dismissive of, of what they do, and my friends and colleagues, etc. Um, but I can't see grounds for bringing it into um, the study of cultural diversity of this kind, because it seems to me that it would be constraining, um, or it would imply that something is more likely and something is less likely, or more cognitive, or, less, or whatever. And I just don't see it. Just don't see it. Sorry. Yes, uh, I'll be very short. Uh, well, uh, let's hear my point of view, which is nobody's point of view, as you mentioned. I'm wearing jeans. But for me, jeans are related with uh, Western movies and cowboys, which means endurance, survival, bravery, and some kind of courage to meet life and uh, its challenges. Does it still survive in the today's uh, jeans wearing? It would be totally a question of age. Um, in my ethnography, people who, people of a, people who remember, as it were, because it was the case. There was a time when that's what jeans represented. Um, right up, probably until, the, you know, I mean, as I said, right up certainly from the fall of communism here, etc., it was really, really important. It was the most important thing about jeans. But for where I'm working in London, um, it depends. For people coming from South Asia who kind of knew nothing of this, no, uh, it doesn't have those kind of connotations. For people who are uh, younger than a certain age and actually none of this was part of their kind of experience in history, no, it has none of that kind of significance. So it's really what I would say, I would see it as retained historical um, significance of jeans. Which means that if you live through that history, it's still part and parcel of who you are and why you wear jeans, and you cannot undo that historical relationship. Um, but, it, but that's the way it comes out ethnographically. Um, there, there are probably, almost, for most of the people I'm dealing with in this particular ethnography, that would not be true. They don't have that kind of set of connotations. But there's lots of people for whom it would be true. It tends to be older, tends to be partly where they came from. I mean, it's presumably here it's going to lose those connotations more slowly than it would do if you're kind of living in the middle of London. Um, so I think it, 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 um, but the direction it's going in is that those things are getting lost. It, it, they, 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 for, I think as people grow up now, those will no longer be important for blue jeans. Okay, let's see. Is it analysis and the relationship between different social parameters, etc. Et I've done lots of those studies. I expect to continue doing lots of those studies. And if you are studying material culture and that's what you get, that's what you study. Having done this study and finding the, and all this emergence, the, the notion of the post-semiotic absolutely coming out of their thought, and realising that this, I have to think again um, about the possibility of this, then your question comes up. Well, is it just genes? Where else? Could it be on a smaller scale? Who else does it? And I'm starting to get people telling me, who are reading this stuff. So, for example, I've got a good friend, Rick Wilk, who works in um, the Caribbean. And one of the things he, he's looking at, and some friends of mine in Brazil, is they're looking at um, rice and beans. And there's a particular thing about rice and beans, which basically 80% uh, of meals in Brazil are based on rice and beans, and if you go to the cabinet, etc., etc., and he's looking at, you know, is rice and beans genes for Brazil? And actually he's coming up with very good evidence that it is. Um, there are certain things that have achieved this kind of certain sort of 
base level, as it were, where they, they work in a different way, the ordinariness of it, because it's 80% is pretty much everybody, right? So there will be other rice and beans out there. But um, as far as I know, this is the first work that's actually made this claim within that question context. Um, so hopefully other people will start doing exactly that. And as you said, for the small scale, maybe it works in a, you know, in a tribal context or something else. I don't know. Um, I'd love to know. Um, we're just finishing this, and then um, let's see if it change, you know, if people start thinking about material culture in a slightly different way. So it's nothing specific in you know, say material culture. But material culture will lend itself to all sorts of different kinds of studies. There's no intrinsic relationship between this notion of the unmarked and uh, any particular set of things. Okay, so that was, yeah, I'm, I'm not coming from a material culture literature, but I was, I mean, starting from the non normative to us. Um, and um, I do really grab the whole idea of blue genes as kind of unmarked categories so on normativity. But um, I'm just thinking if people are really thinking like that, I mean, uh, we take blue jeans for peppers or shirts. So uh, when we wear some things, we always take both of them. Mm -hmm. So actually, um, there are kind of process when normativity is at stake, actually. So I don't understand the separation between the shirt I wear and the blue jeans I wear, so I took them both. Uh, I can buy blue jeans separately, certainly enough. Um, yeah, but when I wear it on the street, um, is it not normativity what I wear? Oh, uh, there or is a part of normativity? Okay. Um, blue jeans are just blue jeans. Um, and it is quite, it doesn't abolish racial prejudice, class, etc. itself in relation to anything else. Somebody's skin colour is not changed by the fact that they're wearing blue jeans. So you could say it's insignificant. Um, as you say, you're still getting out there, you're still Pakistani, etc. Et but um, um, I don't agree in the sense that what I'm arguing is that blue jeans may not have the transformative capacity to colonise everything else that a person is. But in as much as it is blue jeans, I think there is, and uh, it makes a difference, or non-difference, if you want to call it that way. Um, and if you want to be true to the blue jeans, you can actually find other clothing that, in a sense, speaks more to the attempt to, to integrate the other clothing into the non-normative blue jeans. So, for example, if, you're, if you go out in blue jeans and a t-shirt, all right, and nondescript shoes, you're kind of trying for a consistency with your blue jeans, and you can be pretty successful with that, play t-shirts, and you do things like that. Um, if you, however, dress it up with all sorts of other things, including ethnic clothing, you can wear, as I a shawl and jeans, etc., then you're doing something actually quite interesting. And it's not that the jeans are not significant. If I'm an Indian woman, and I wear shawl kameez, right, um, and chewed or something like that, and um, so I make kameez. Um, and um, in the entire ethnic dress, I don't think I'm the same as if I'm wearing jeans and something. I'm basically, in a sense, trying to have it somewhat both ways, and people will speak to that. Um, so, so I think the jeans don't do more than the jeans do. The jeans do do what the jeans do, if that makes sense. And that's not insignificant in itself. Um, I think that it, is, it, it can be very expressive around how people perceive. And I get that from my informants. Um, you, do jeans make you more, just because you're wearing jeans, do you feel more relaxed? Do you feel more confident? Do you feel more comfortable? Yes, yes, yes. Um, even though you have to mix them with something else. Even though you still carry lots of other baggage. Does it make a difference to you? Um, an important difference sometimes to people. It, do they really think their lives are better because they can wear blue jeans? Actually, yes, they do. And that's why I think one can talk in these terms. It's very clear that this actually has a real, uh, it, it really tra changes things. Not everything, not the things that it isn't. But I would argue that's why, in answer to your question, yes, it does make sense to talk about the normativity of some things and the ordinariness of the other. Because it does not, even though you can't go out, you know, head to foot in the illusions of you would look seriously weird. Um, and that don't do double dead, it's really not, not good. Um, but um, but even, even though you can't do that, nevertheless, I think that it, it, it 
what comes out of excess wealth of people is what blue jeans do do. I die in Levi's, that's ordinary, right? Uh, I only have to think about it. 
Um, and, and certainly I have people just like that, believe me. Um, so I think that um, you, what you brought up is, the, is um, this sense that even the ordinary has a context, a diverse context in which it kind of works. And we certainly would say that for women, going into seeing a woman with quite a few pairs of as you say, as well as the unordinary ones, the skinny ones and the dressy ones and all the rest of it, is not uncommon. And I think that's the reason. Um, much more common than women. But uh, kind of that kind of detail is in the book. Um, I'm glad you asked that because it just so happens um, I have previously worked on Kobe Kona, some of you might know the, the paper, and I used that to make almost the exact opposite argument to the one I made today. In that, um, if there were some things that were diverse but are becoming homogenized, there are some things that look homogenized but become diverse. And you can't tell just from the thing itself. Coke just looks like Coke, wherever you are. But I wrote a paper called Coca-Cola, a black sweet drink from Trinidad. And the reason I called it a black sweet drink from Trinidad is that in England we don't have a category called black sweet drink, right? Um, there's another thing. But in Trinidad you do. And unless you understand that Coca-Cola stands in relation to that very specific Trinidadian category of black sweet drink, and that then relates to ethnicity in Trinidad, and the history of relationships with Americans in Trinidad, and all these other things, you don't realize that Coca-Cola in Trinidad is totally Trinidadian. It bears very little in relation to global Coca-Cola. And I think the point is that things, material culture, you've got to be open to the trajectories that these things go in. Um, things that heterogenize, things that homogenize, um, etc. What we mustn't do is think that we know. Is think that we see what a bottle of Coca Cola is, that way lies consciousness. See a bottle of Coca Cola, and I can tell you what it is. Um, see beans, and I can tell you what it is. We're homogenous. And it turns out that the thing we thought was homogeneous turns out to be heterogeneous, and the thing we thought was heterogeneous turns out to be homogeneous. So the cocoa is interesting because I, it's almost the exact opposite argument to today's paper. And really, it would be good to look at the two in juxtaposition just to see that difference. Uh, yeah, um, if I should respond to my question when you were talking about the shirts. Um, I honestly don't see that that would add anything at all, um, because, um, let's take it to a agency. It's clear from my analysis that I am saying that genes have considerable significance. They're doing really important things there, right? Um, that comes from the analysis, looking at the consequences, looking at the explanation of why people wear it. If I then turned around and said, oh, that shows that genes have agency, um, it would really be a semantic, I mean, I've already told you genes have agency, I just didn't call it agency. And I think the problem I feel with the, the Torian analysis is that it gets to be a bit like functionalism. You know, if, if everything has agency, or everything's a network, then what have you said? Have you, add any, have you added anything to your understanding of the phenomena by saying to you? Now, there are cases where you do. I have written papers where I have used concepts of agency because for example, I'm interested in, I wrote a paper about ghosts and houses, and I'm interested in the anthropomorphic implication, which is not at all actually, um, something I was saying is implied by the term agency. But if I took the paper I've just done, um, you could say, if you want to put Latour on top, like whipped cream, go for it. Um, but I, for me, it's an added richness, as it were. I'm, 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 I don't see reasons to do it. I don't see what it adds. Uh, context, especially past context, in which uh, wearing blue 
proteins meant something. It was maybe easier to, to do, I don't know, pinpoint the significance of that action. Uh, so uh, there was actually a, um, a semiotic era, so to speak, of, of wearing blue jeans. And my question is, how and why the transition to fast semiotics took place? Hmm. Um. Um, I think what I can give you, I mean, I will obviously have to address back the paper itself. Um, the paper tries to document that process, and it does it in terms of things like here. It's, it's absolutely right in my paper, but I'm saying it starts with deeply semiotic kind of connotations, and gradually they get lost over time. Um, I think that the, the why includes um, I suspect that, that I am kind of implying that London may be in the vanguard of this. It doesn't mean that everybody's going to come like London, but I don't think it's a coincidence that the things I was saying about London in relation to kind of post identity, if you like, um, make it a very good place for this kind of thing to be happening around Jews. But I don't think it's just London, I think equivalent things might happen elsewhere. So, um, Beyond that, I think, you know, I mean, I, I, I'd be careful in, in trying to say too much at this point. Um, I think that I don't want to imply yet that this is a... Tri the problem with the why answer is it could lead to an implication that this is, as I said, abandoned. I'm showing you the future of the world. Everything is going to go out. And I really don't believe that. I think that like, what I'd like to see is comparative studies around this phenomenon. Um, understanding also, as I said, the carry the things going in the other direction. And then you can start to say, why in this instance do you get this trajectory, but you don't get it there? Um, and is this something that is becoming a tendency more generally, or is it more sort of unique in particular to the context of say London, etc.? Um, so I think that you know I get I think I've given a lot of why, and I'm being reticent about giving much more why than I have given until you see it in that wider context.